Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless. Why would the devil want to possess a human body? And the answer lies at the very core of our Christian faith. The devil wants to mimic God. What's the greatest thing that God has done for us? The incarnation. God has taken on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. And the devil, in his own twisted sense, believes that he takes on human form when he possesses a human body. But when he does that, because the human person is created in the image and likeness of God, he wants to distort the human person. That's why the manifestations that we see are meant to scare and terrify. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, I'd like to start by saying thank you to all of you for taking the time to watch and listen to the videos in this channel, and hopefully you've learned a lot by what has been shared so far. I'm thinking of making this a new series on this channel, exposing the devil in the modern world, to work against him and to reveal that he does exist. As Pope Francis said, the devil exists, and we must fight against him. Well, for this video, I'd like to address something very important. I came across a few comments in some of the videos in this channel, saying the devil isn't real. The devil isn't real. The devil isn't real. As Monsignor Ronald Knox, the eminent British convert, author, retreat master, and translator of the Bible once said, it is stupid of modern civilization to have given up believing in the devil when he is the only explanation of it. The goal of the Christian life is to unite our will with the will of God. When the angels were created, God gave the angels that opportunity as well, basically saying to the angels, I've created you, I've given you this great intellect, and with all the knowledge I've given you, will you now use that knowledge and turn to me? And what did Lucifer do? He chose to turn away from God, and when he did so, he influenced one-third of the angelic choir to join in his rebellion. The book of Revelation tells us that his tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky. And what does the devil want us to do? He also wants us to turn our backs on God and to go our own way. When we do that, it leads to division. So division. We should not be surprised that the devil directs his energy to division and disunity. He desires to divide people from God, from each other, and from their very selves. The devil works against our redemption in Jesus Christ, which reconciles us to God and allows us to share in the unity of the Holy Trinity. Do you know what the word redemption means? We hear that word a lot. It might even be a religious buzzword, so to speak. But the word redemption literally means to buy back. And when Jesus died on the cross, what was he doing? He was buying us back from the devil. And when had we been sowed out to the devil? There in the garden with the sin of Adam and Eve, original sin. When we choose to embrace Christ and follow him, we enjoy that great gift of redemption. The devil has become a joke. Nothing may have done more to kill belief in Satan than all those cartoons in which demons trade one-liners amid unthreatening flames with balding gents fresh off the links of a country club. Getting people not to believe in him is one of the devil's favorite tricks. The cartoons help. But there's too much evidence of his existence for disbelief to be a viable option. The testimony is abundant in scripture. The magisterium, writings by and about the saints, and contemporary accounts of demonic manifestations and exorcisms. There are two extremes to be avoided this matter, fearful obsession with the devil and ignoring the fact that we live on a battlefield with the devil and his forces drawn up against us. The letter to the Ephesians puts it best, we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. The Church of England in 2015 removed any mention of the devil from its baptismal ritual. Claiming to have test marketed, a simplified service throughout the United Kingdom, clergy concluded that asking parents and godparents to reject the devil and all rebellion against God put people off who are offended to be addressed as sinners. 
Driven by powerful clergy within the Church of England, the new baptismal rite was an attempt to demonstrate their church was sufficiently progressive to no longer need to renounce the devil in order to live in the freedom of the children of God. The devil, however, would want us to collapse with him into eternal death and everlasting alienation from God. He does this by drawing us into a world of deceit and untruth, whereby we become broken. On the night before he died, Jesus prayed. This is in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one. The devil's attempts at dividing us represent the counterpoint to Jesus' triumphal work of healing, reconciling, and unifying. The devil wants to stymie us, to halt us, and even paralyze us on life's journey of bringing a sense of unity to our existence. He can make us feel overwhelmed so that we will give up. He stirs up fears to make us frightened so that we will withdraw. He can suggest that we compare ourselves to others so that we look bad in comparison. He sets us up against each other with the likes of anger, resentment, contempt, greed, and impatience. He can short-circuit our lives with things like drugs and various forms of addictions or infidelity. Think of the opioid crisis, alcohol abuse, addiction to pornography, the breakup of the family, abortion, euthanasia, and the list goes on and on and on. The devil is real, not a myth or a symbol or a story to keep us in line. The devil is a real creature who lurks among us in the world even today. In 2014, Pope Francis reminded Catholics that the life of every Christian is a constant battle against the devil, just as Jesus, during his life, had to struggle against the devil and his many temptations. We too are tempted, we too are the target of attacks by the devil. Drawing upon scripture, Pope Francis recalled how Jesus' first temptation by the devil was almost like a seduction. Every Catholic should know what's distinctive about Christianity. Christianity is not about our search for God. It's about God's search for us. So it's not that we're looking for God, but God is looking for us. You think again about Adam and Eve. They're cast out of the garden into the wilderness. And then God begins to put a plan in place to go in search of lost humanity. It's to send his son. When Jesus begins his public ministry, right after he's baptized, the Holy Spirit drives him into the desert, into the wilderness. Why did he go there? In search of lost humanity. But who did he have to contend with first? Satan, the one who caused the fall of humanity. He had to deal with him, and then he went in search of lost humanity. You look at the public ministry of Jesus. One story after another, Jesus is finding people who are lost. You think of the story of you know, the, the shepherd with a hundred sheep and he loses one. That one represents lost humanity. The woman with 10 coins and loses one. And she, you know, searches the house diligently looking for that lost one. That's humanity again. That gives us the idea of just how much God loves humanity, that he will go to great efforts to find anyone who is lost. And even the ministry of exorcism, I think, is about God's search for people who are lost. So again, I think it's really important for Catholics to realize that Christianity, again, is not about our search for God. It's about God's search for us. The world must know that the devil exists. The devil and demons are many, and they have two powers, the ordinary and the extraordinary. The so-called ordinary power is that of tempting man to distance himself from God and take him to hell. This action is exercised against all men and women of all places and religions. As for the extraordinary powers used by the devil, Father Amorth explained it as how the devil acts when he focuses his attention more specifically on a person. 
He categorized the expression of that attention into four types. Diabolical possession, diabolical vexation like in the case of Padre Pio, who was beaten by the devil, obsessions which are able to lead a person to desperation and infestation, and when the devil occupies a space, an animal, or even an object. While we're talking about the late Father Amorth, there's something that I'd like to share with you that's very interesting. Father Amorth asked the demon more than once during exorcisms, why are you so scared of John Paul II? And he have had two different responses, both interesting. One, because Pope John Paul disrupted my plans. And Father Amorth thinks that the demon is referring to the fall of communism in Russia and Eastern Europe, the collapse of communism. Another response that he gave Father Amorth was, because he pulled so many young people from my hands. There are so many young people who, thanks to John Paul II, were converted. Perhaps some were already Christian, but not practicing. But then with John Paul II, they came back to the practice. He pulled so many young people out of my hands. Well, I like to close out the video with another point shared by Father Vincent Lampert just a little bit more. And Lucifer could not accept the fact that, again, human flesh would be elevated higher than himself. And it does seem that the angels, when they were created, were able to see this plan of God for humanity. And that's something, the incarnation, which the devil rejected, which is interesting because then in an, ex in an exorcism, you know, demonic possession, the demon in his own sense believes it's his version of the incarnation, that he's taking on human flesh. But what does he do to the human person? He mocks it. He makes the, the uh, person maybe do bizarre things, the levitation, the eyes roll the back of the head, the growling and snarling. He almost dehumanizes the person as a way to indirectly attack God himself. Because again, when you think about God taking on human form, it's the glorification of the human person. But a demon possessing a human person distorts the human person almost to an animalistic level. And I think that's what the devil is trying to do. It's indirectly trying to attack and mock God when a demon possesses a human person. So again, all of these manifestations, again, are meant to instill fear. And I've seen it all over the years. I've seen, I did an exorcism not long ago when the demon manifested, the person's eyeballs turned green in front of me, their pupils became slanted like a serpent. And then this very deep and authoritative voice comes out telling me, well, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. And basically also saying, Jesus has no power over us. But again, the devil is the father of lies. You don't pay attention to any of these types of things. It's always important for the exorcist to stay focused on the power of God. That, you know, God has given to his church and to his ministers. You know, every exorcist, really, the true exorcist in every diocese is the local bishop. He has that authority based on chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, right in verse 1. Jesus sends out the 12, and he gives them authority over all unclean spirits. So those who have apostolic succession have the authority to deal with any demon. And then a bishop can bestow that uh, authority on any of his priests that he chooses to do so. So it's important for me to operate within the authority of my local bishop. If I just go out there on my own, then I don't have that apostolic authority behind me. I don't have the power and the authority of the church behind me. And ultimately, the demons would not have to listen to anything that I would have to say, because I'm going up as an individual against a demon rather than as a representative of the church. Well, that's all for this video. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video. Christians should not fear the devil, provided that we fully embrace the victory of Jesus Christ. Often we are afraid of the devil and his demonic forces when we begin to doubt Jesus' power. We think that the devil is more powerful when in truth he runs away like a coward when the name of Jesus is uttered. If we have a firm and confident faith in Jesus, we should have nothing to fear. And finally, for those of you who'd like to support my works, and I don't mind any amount of contribution at all because every bit helps, I left the link to my PayPal donation in the description box below. I'd like to say thanks so much to those who have donated. I can only repay your help by delivering more videos for all of you, hoping that every information I share will be of help to you. Again, thank you so much and God bless you. 
So the devil really wants to tempt us to give in to sin, to do something wrong, and then he accuses us before God. You know, like, well, look at you. You thought you were such a good person, but look at what you did. But when we confess our sins, we place them in the hands of God. And once we place them in the hands of God, the devil no longer has anything that he can use to accuse us against. So that's why any exorcist will tell you that a good confession is better than an exorcism. And ultimately, no amount of exorcism or deliverance prayers can take the place of the need for one to declare the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. So again, it's not just a matter of wanting the demonic to go away. It's really about fostering a right relationship with God. That's why even in an exorcism, I don't really pay attention to all the manifestations. We touched on the things the devil does basically to divert attention away from the prayer of the church into his theatrics. But the reality is in an exorcism, the focus is always on the power of God and not what the devil is trying to do to disrupt that prayer of the church. And so again, it's the very common aspects of our faith, the sacramental life of the church. Go to confession, you know. You know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, I feel bad if I go to confession. I keep confessing the same things. You know, after 32 years of being a priest, I tell people, you know, it's okay to confess the same things. And why? Because it's an indication to God that you're still in the fight. Maybe the battle hasn't been won, but you're still in the fight. To me, the greater danger would be to say, I keep doing the same thing, so I'm not going to confess it anymore. That mentality means that one has surrendered to the sin. But I think as long as we can still call sin a sin, then we are still giving God an opportunity for him to bestow his grace upon us.